Good morning. We have general questions. Uh, question number one in the name of Michael McMahon. Um, Michael has been um, unavoidably detained, so I'm just going right on to question number two, Christina McKelvey. Um, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect people from the impact of revenge pornography. Michael, uh, sorry, Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. Uh, distributing and publishing revenge porn is a despicable crime, especially as it is often motivated by an intention to humiliate the victim. Uh, that is why the Scottish Government considers there is a strong case for creating a specific offence, making it illegal to share explicit, intimate images without consent. And we intend to seek views on this matter soon. A bespoke criminal offence would assist procedures uh, and prosecutors and send a clear signal to society that such behaviour is criminal. There are, however, existing laws which prosecutors can currently use when prosecuting the distribution of explicit images of another person without their consent. Uh, for example, offences of threatening and abusive behaviour or improper use of a public communication network may apply. Uh, prosecutors are committed uh, to ensuring that these criminal activities are effectively dealt with. Can I thank the ca Cabinet Secretary for, for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that, um, personally, I have been involved in this campaign for a number of years now, but Scottish Women's Aid have, have recently uh, restarted their campaign Stop Revenge Porn in Scotland with the tagline, It's not your fault, we are here for you. One of the things that I am very interested in is what the Cabinet Secretary did about a, a bespoke criminal offence, which is something uh, I am hoping that he is looking at very, very Get carefully. Um, he also mentioned existing laws, and one of the things that concerns me is whether prosecutors um, in question actually um, you know, are using those existing laws. So what education is being put in place to ensure that prosecutors are using the laws at their disposal now, and whether he will commit to work with Scottish Women's Aid on this bespoke criminal offence to ensure that we stamp this thing out for good? Well, I'm aware of the member's uh, campaign on this issue and indeed her, uh, I think, debate within this uh, parliament. So I'm aware that she uh, is prescient, uh, perhaps, in uh, leading uh, the requirement for action. Uh, we've obviously entered into discussions with Scottish Women's Aid. Uh, the Lord Advocate has been pivotal in leading on this issue. I think I can give you an assurance that the Crown are aware of the complexity of this. Uh, they understand the great harm that it causes because Scottish Women's Aid liaise with them. Uh, for that reason, uh, prosecutors are uh, advised and indeed schooled and trained on the current laws that are available. But I think the Lord Advocate has made it clear that a bespoke offence uh, would be better, it would make it simpler and more straightforward for prosecutors. So I think I can give the member the assurance that we're going to work on all those areas, use the appropriate laws that we have at the present moment to the best of our abilities, ensure that those, whether in police, whether in the uh, uh, Crown, are properly appraised of them and properly trained and schooled. And equally, I can give her the assurance that we're seeking to uh, go into consultation uh, on uh, a bespoke offence. The devil is always in the detail, but we are aware that other jurisdictions are proceeding uh, to bring in such uh, uh, legislation, uh, and that's something that we require to consider, and we will do so positively. Question three, Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government in relation to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Minister Fergus Ewing. Scottish Ministers have discussed the TTIP with the UK Government at meetings of the JMC in March and October this year. In addition, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has, has been in correspondence with the UK Secretary of State for Health regarding concerns, Presiding Officer, about the impact of TTIP on the Scottish NHS. Officials are actively engaging with UK government officials about the progress of the negotiations and any potential implications for Scotland. Lord Campbell. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, Minister, I have seen a copy of a letter from Vince Cable of the Department of Business and Innovation and Skills to members of Parliament at the House of Commons, uh, dated the 22nd of September. I don't know whether the Minister has had an opportunity to consider that. Is he happy with the UK Government's assurances on the substance, in particular, of the uh, interstate dispute settlement provisions? And does he believe, or does the Scottish Government have a view as to the transparency of the negotiations taking place? Minister. Uh, well, as Mr Campbell is aware, uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, is primarily dealing with this, but uh, my understanding is that assurances have been sought from the EU Commission and from the UK Government. The response from the EU Commission has been encouraging. The response from the UK Government 
has uh, uh, had a, a lack of an unequivocal assurance that the NHS will remain uh, as it is at the moment and not open to potentially being sued for not going down the privatisation route. So that is something upon which we are still seeking cast iron assurances from, from the UK government. Question number four, Jimmy McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it will take forward the recommendations of the Wild Fisheries Review. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Independent Wild Fisheries Review, chaired by Andrew Thin, submitted its thorough and wide-ranging report to me on the 8th of October 2014. This government takes the conservation status of our wild fisheries seriously and is determined to ensure that the management of our fisheries is fit for purpose for the 21st century. I have committed to considering the review's report and its recommendations in depth and consulting on proposals for a new management system for our wild fisheries in due course to ensure a sustainable future for that sector. Jamie McGregor. Uh, well, I'm encouraged by that answer. Um, one of the recommendations of the review is to halt the declines in Atlantic salmon stocks. Recent reports from NASCO point to a decline in Atlantic salmon numbers at sea from 10 million to 3.6 million, and the percentage of returning salmon smolts to Scottish rivers has dropped alarmingly in recent years. So what will the Scottish Government do to improve and fulfil its international obligations towards conserving salmon stocks? Should it not follow the example of Ireland, which in 2007 brought its drift netting regulations in line, line with scientific advice and evidence? Will not the Scottish Government do the same with net harvesting of mixed stock fisheries? And can the Minister inform me of any timetable relating to the progress of the review and its recommendations? Minister. Uh, it was a few questions there, uh, Presiding Officer. I hope you have your pa patience is on, uh, uh, on, on display today with my answer. Um, in terms of uh, salmon stocks, clearly conservation is very important. We have announced a, a preliminary move in terms of uh, closed season, bringing into play uh, measures which were done on a voluntary basis but putting them on a mandatory footing. Uh, and that the member will be aware that we're taking that forward uh, for the period up to 1st uh, of first of April across Scotland, and we are going to be consulting on that shortly. Um, we have also uh, had conversations with colleagues in Norway, Iceland and Chile about similar challenges they face in terms of high mortality rates for salmon. Uh, there is, it's fair to say that there's a degree of uncertainty about the causes of mortality of salmon. Clearly, uh, there have been suggestions made. We need to do more research collectively, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with governments in Chile and Norway on how we can take forward a common agenda on research about the future uh, conservation states of the species. But clearly, other areas like netting uh, were part of the review, and uh, Andrew Thin has brought forward recommendations which we are considering about the future management of netting activity as well. I just merely say to, to Mr McGregor that there are different circumstances in Ireland and England to those in Scotland in terms of heritable rights for netting in Scotland, and we have to take that into consideration. But we are taking very seriously our obligations on conservation of salmon and other species. Mr Gibson, have you promised to ask one question? I'll give you a supplementary. Thank you, President Officer. It's a very short one. Since the demand for more uh, beets uh, in the wider angling community and young anglers uh, is something which uh, we should welcome, how will the Scottish Government develop the angling for all proposals that are contained in the Wild Fisheries Review? Minister. <laughs> Uh, clearly, th this is a very important aspect of Andrew Thin's review. We are keen to see a, f a viable future for the sport of angling. It's a very popular sport, but we are aware that there are difficulties in accessing opportunities for young people to enter the sport and to make sure that there is uh, uh, adequate provision for the general population to enjoy a sport sustainably and with conservation of the species in mind. So I assure the member these are issues that we are looking at very closely, and I am aware of the, the particular programme that he has identified, and we will come forward with recommendations in due course. Question five, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it has offered to employees affected by Tata Steel's sale of its long products divisions, which has operations in DL and Clydebridge. Minister Fergus Ewing. Presiding Officer, this is a worrying time indeed for the employees of Tata Steel and their families. On learning of this announcement, Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary for Training, Youth and Women's Employment, spoke with John Park. Strategy and Policy Director at the Community Trade Union, which represents the majority of the Scottish workforce. Yesterday, I spoke with John to maintain our close links with the workforce and to discuss the emerging situation, and I have agreed to meet him 
for further discussions. I have also spoken to David Mundell, MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Scotland, regarding the concerns of the workforce in Scotland, and I followed that up with a letter to Vince Cable, underlining our commitment to work together with the UK Government to safeguard jobs and investment in Scotland. Finally, Scottish Enterprise has maintained its dialogue with Tata Steel, is engaging with the Clash Group. At present, there has been no announcement of any impact on jobs. However, we continue to closely monitor developments and stand ready to support the workforce. Claire Adams. Thank the Minister for his answers. What assurances may be obtained that if Clash Group successfully buy the Tata Scottish operations, that jobs will be maintained in the Scottish sites? Uh. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I picked up the, the actual precise wording of the question, but I want to assure the member that we will leave no stone unturned. We will do absolutely everything possible to preserve and protect the jobs in Scotland. It's a priority for us, and across the Scottish Government, we will uh, do everything within our power to maintain the steel production in Scotland. John Pentland. Thank you, President Officer. And while I can appreciate the Minister and his involvement so far, uh, I think everybody will agree that any takeover is, uh, raises big concerns, and I think on this occasion the, these concerns can be well justified because Clash has a reputation for asset stripping and dumping companies, which poses a threat to steel workers in Motherwell and Camus Lang and to Scottish manufacturing and the wider economy. So, whilst I can ask the, the, the Minister that, that he's had this consultation, has he directly asked for a meeting with uh, both Tata and Clash to? Uh, remove these concerns for the people who I represent in Mull and Minister? Well, I have I've had uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, visit the Scottish sites and have had discussions with Tata then. And, of course, we continue to engage closely with the companies. The primary uh, responsibility at the moment and the primary need for the moment at the moment uh, that Mr Pentland is aware of is for Scottish Enterprise, through Lena Wilson, its chief executive, directly to pursue discussions, both with Tata and with the Clash Group. I can assure Mr Pentland, uh, firstly, that we will keep him fully informed of all developments, as Angela Constance made clear at the outset. And secondly, that uh, I personally will be liaising extremely closely uh, with uh, Lena Wilson in the work that they do. This is absolutely essential that we do everything we can to maintain steel production in Scotland. Uh, and we rely, of course, on the UK Government in working closely with us and fully cooperating with us, and we shall make sure within our power that that happens as well. Question 6, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what control measures it is considering uh, following its recent consultation on promoting responsible dog ownership. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. As the member will know, the consultation focused on a range of issues to promote responsible dog ownership, including compulsory microchipping, licensing, muzzling and dog fouling. It also provided an opportunity to suggest alternative measures to foster responsible dog ownership. There was a good response to the consultation with over 2,000 responses submitted. Analysis of those responses is now complete and we will actually be publishing the analysis report on the Scottish Government website tomorrow. I am sure the member will wish to read the report in due course, but what I can say is that there appears to be wide support for compulsory microchipping, little support for compulsory muzzling, and mixed views regarding some of the other measures in the consultation. The Government, of course, will now be carefully considering these views and will seek to announce a response and next steps in the near future. Paul Martin. Uh, officer, as the Minister is aware, I do, and I am sure all members in the Chamber want to work together to ensure that we take forward uh, this very issue, but it has been over a year. Uh, since Brogan McQuaig was attacked uh, in our local, in my constituency. And I wonder what action the Minister can take to ensure that we actually come forward to this chamber with the proposals that we wish to take to ensure that we take an everlasting commitment to ensure that we give our communities absolute maximum protection from irresponsible dog owners and dangerous dogs. Cabinet Secretary. And, of course, it's exactly in response to the horrific incidents in the members' constituency and elsewhere in Scotland that we are taking these issues very, very seriously and conducted this wide-ranging consultation on a number of measures that could make a, a real difference. Uh, we have to balance the, the interests of animal welfare with public safety and will give careful consideration to the measures, but I can assure the, the member and the rest of the chamber the government is taking these issues very, very seriously indeed and we will bring forward measures uh, as quickly as we can. Question 7, Willie Coffey. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in introducing a direct rail service from Kilmarnock to Edinburgh. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, through the next ScotRail franchise, Kilmarnock will benefit from the extension of the new two early services from Stranraer, which provides eight services a day in each direction, enabling connection to Glasgow via Barhead. In addition, the extension of the Stranraer to air services to Kilmarnock offer increased connection via Dumfries to Carlisle. This route will further benefit from more services from December 2017, catering provision from December 2015, scenic trains en route, new platform waiting shelters, increased cycle storage, rolling stock refresh, including fitting, auto door closing and Wi-Fi plus, and more generally, the rollout of smart cards and fares initiatives. However, throughout the life of the franchise, we will continue to work closely with the franchisee in the review of current service levels and demand as we seek to identify even more improvements for passengers. Billy Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer. He is fully aware of the employment opportunities that a direct service with reduced journey times to the capital would have for my constituents and that these may not require much investment in the existing rail infrastructure. Uh, would the Minister agree to meet with me to discuss the matter further and see how we might take this forward? Minister. The member, of course, has been a staunch champion for the improvements to the services, some of which I have outlined, and I am sure that was noticed by the uh, franchise bidders during that process. Uh, of course, some of the longer-term improvements involve infrastructure and also timetabling, but I am more than happy to meet the member to discuss these. Question 8, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has suspended the use of transvaginal mesh implants. Mr Michael Matheson. In line with the Cabinet Secretary for Health's announcement on the 17th of June, the Acting Chief Medical Officer wrote to all health boards on the 20th of June requesting that they consider suspending transvaginal mesh implant procedures. Mr Findlay. Since the 17th of June, when indeed that letter was sent uh, and when mesh was supposed to be suspended, one health board alone, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, has implanted a further 29 women with these tainted products. And as we know, that uh, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer wrote to health boards asking them, and I quote, to encourage women to take part in clinical trials. So was the Cabinet Secretary's call to suspend MESH genuine, or has he been undermined by his senior officials and some within the medical profession who have a vested interest in continuing to implant MESH? Minister. Uh, Sign officer, um, I do not think it is appropriate to question whether the Cabinet Secretary's request to suspend the use of this particular mesh is genuine or not. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, stated in the strongest possible terms about the uh, potential for suspending these types of uh, procedures. However, the Member will also be aware that there will be individual circumstances where clinicians, in consultation with the women involved, will consider all of the potential risk factors and potential complications, and the women themselves may choose to go ahead with that particular uh, procedure. And we should allow women who may wish to make that decision to be able to do so. In relation to the uh, Deputy uh, Chief Medical Officer's letter as well, this is in relation to a different procedure and came about as a result of a request from clinicians about a new procedure that they were looking to undertake and to encourage women to take part within those clinical trials in order to improve that procedure for the women concerned themselves. But I do think it is rather disingenuous of the member to try and suggest that the Cabinet Secretary has been other than being committed to trying to address this dreadful issue. Question number nine, John Wilson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress local authorities have made in settling equal pay claims. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, local authorities' equal pay claims are the responsibility of the local authorities concerned, and the Scottish Government therefore does not hold data on them. However, the Scottish Government is keen to see a resolution to all local authority equal pay claims and will continue to encourage councils to resolve all such issues as quickly as possible. John Wilson. I thank the Minister for his response. What assurances can the Minister give to those many thousands of low paid female workers who were affected by the failure of local authorities to settle equal pay claims? claims timelessly that these claims will now be settled much quicker and they will receive full compensation for the equal pay claims that should have been paid out many years ago. Minister. Well, that is, of course, a matter for local authorities, but Scottish Government has tried to be helpful in encouraging local authorities along. And where there is a financial pressure to bring closure to this issue, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, John Swinney, 
has agreed to the request from COSLA to provide more financial flexibility to deal with equal pay claims. So we hope within that uh, set-up and that response that the outstanding local authorities who remain to conclude these matters will do so as quickly as possible. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question